It's now our privilege to invite Professor Paolo Blickstein to deliver our first keynote under the title, Transformative Technologies for Innovative Learning, Moving Towards the 21st Century Education. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Blickstein. Madam Prime Minister Yang Lak Shinawat, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Minister of Education, Mr. Pongtep Tekkanjaina, Ms. Secretary General of the Education Council, Dr. Sasitara Pishai Shanarong, Mr. Chairman of the Sukhsabad Foundation, Mr. Paron Yatsanayana. Thank you for the invitation for this amazing event in Thailand. I'm very honored to be here. Before moving to the United States 13 years ago, I lived in a country very similar to Thailand, Brazil. They might look very different, but they are very similar in one thing. We both know, Brazilian and Thais, that the necessary condition to sustainable development and a better life for all of our citizens is the improvement of education. Human capital is the most precious and valuable type of capital. And why? Every single piece of research shows that better educated people have a higher income, lead happier lives, educate better their kids, are more productive, spend less time doing repetitive work, have less issues with substance abuse and violence. Education also makes us more humble because the more you know, the more you understand that you need to know more. Better at understanding other cultures more prone to respect and be tolerant to other peoples and traditions. Education also makes us more capable to see what we can become. As Paulo Freire would say, it guides us out of the here and now of being stuck in our everyday problems towards the world of possibilities of solutions. Education has worked very well for us for centuries in many different formats. But somewhere, this project went wrong. And it went wrong when, after the Industrial Revolution, we were in love with the idea of mass producing everything. We fell in love with the assembly line. So we decided to make education an industrial product. We standardized curriculum. We invented the school bell. We grouped students by age. The only problem is that that was done before any research on education had ever been done. Of course, the mass production of education did wonders to universalize schooling, but we designed a system not knowing anything about the brain, about human learning, motivation, behavior, memory, and children's developmental stages. But now that we know a lot more about education and the human brain, we are stuck with the old system which is very resistant to change and terribly inefficient given the new technologies we have. If you survey every country on earth, only about 10 will say that they are happy with their educational systems. How is it possible that countries spending 5% of their national product, which is in the case of the United States accounts for almost $1 trillion, are still unhappy? One explanation is the industry of rankings, another thing we inherited from the industrial age. We have stopped talking about our national vision for educational and started to obsess over rankings. In a ranking, only one country can be first and then everyone else is unhappy. But that does not mean that all the other countries are doing it wrong and they should copy the number one. Education is not an international contest. It's not the World Cup or the Olympics. International contests are about preparing a very small elite group of people for a two-week competition. Education is about millions and millions of children of all sorts of cultural backgrounds, previous abilities, and interests. The way we should think about such a mega system is very different. A couple of years ago, Finland got the first place in the Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, an international test organized by the OCDE in more than 20 countries. 
Everyone went crazy about the Finnish system. Then a year ago, the province of Shanghai topped Finland in the PISA ranking, which was second by a small margin. Everyone started saying, oh, maybe the Finnish system was wrong after all. Let's now look at the Chinese system. That is not how a country should design its educational system. It's not about chasing the newest fashion in education, just looking at who is number one. But there are other problems. If you look at some of the top countries or provinces in the PISA test, Singapore, Shanghai, or Hong Kong, the first fact that comes to mind is that most are city-states, not large countries with diverse populations. Managing an educational system in one single city or region is a lot different than in a country such as Brazil, Thailand, or the United States with large, diverse populations. Second, if you look at what is really happening in some of the, those countries in terms of how they are organizing their educational systems, it's a nationally organized test preparation machine rather than real education. Children are spending 12, 13, 15 hours a day memorizing facts and learning how to do well in tests. Try to give them a problem without a clear right answer and they don't know what to do. And most problems in real life do not have a clear right answer, especially the ones that matter. Finally, there are methodological problems. It has been shown that some countries administer the test in the middle of the school year, while others do it more towards the end. Some do it before the summer vacation, some do it after, some, some do it when the kids are half a year younger. Different countries teach the content in a different order. There are so many problems that many scholars are calling for a complete reevaluation of what those rankings mean. Rankings made for flashy news but can generate terrible policy. So should we forget about international comparison altogether? No, of course not. But it has to be a comprehensive analysis and we need to look at other things. For example, the GIM report, a worldwide survey on entrepreneurship and innovation, shows that there is a mild negative correlation between the PISA scores and the scores that measure innovation, new ideas for businesses, and willingness to take entrepreneurial risks. But the rankings are not the only problem we have. The second problem is that instead of creating lifelong learners, we are creating lifelong haters of learning. It's not just the countries that are unhappy. The children are very unhappy as well. The latest statistics from the OECD show that 52% of our students, on a global average, find school boring and 30% just dislike school altogether. But the problem is even greater in an area that is even more crucial today, science, engineering, and mathematics. In the United States, by seventh grade, only 25% of students have self-declared interest in becoming a scientist or engineer. We manage to scare 75% by age 13. Now try to imagine, do you know an actor who would tell you, I hated acting classes in school, but I decided to become an actor? Career choice is of course related to generating early interest, and we are doing a terrible job at it, especially during the most critical formative years of our children. Actually, two American researchers, Maltes and Tai, just last year published an important paper that changed a lot about what people think about science and mathematical careers. It used to be that people thought that the number of math courses or your average grades in math and science courses were the best predictors for a science and engineering career choice. But after a careful examination of the data, they found something remarkable. The best predictor for a science and engineering career choice was the self-declared interest in these disciplines in eighth grade. In other words, the best way to predict if a child is going to be a scientist or engineer is to ask in eighth grade if he or she is genuinely interested in science, much more than if they are getting good grades. 
What researchers and policymakers are realizing more and more is that no country will have lots of engineers and scientists if we keep making kids hate math and science, no matter how much we test them, no matter how much we threaten their teachers, no matter how much we sugarcoat outdated mathematical content in video games or fun to watch videos. But of course, this is not just about training people to be engineers. We live in a highly complex world surrounded by technology. We live in a time with hard scientific challenges, such as climate change, and there are very important political decisions that we must make in the coming years and decades. We need people to understand science enough to make informed decisions. We need people to understand technology, even if they, their career will not be in technology. We need people to know what's inside things, know how they work. In my research, I interview people about this. For example, I ask them to draw pictures of different everyday artifacts. For example, here we have a, a thermostat drawn by two different people. You can clearly see that they are very similar, except for the drawing ability. However, the first one was done by a nine-year-old and the second by an undergrad student from a famous American university. We are finding this over and over in our data. So we are seeing that people don't know how things work. We are training a generation of people who are only users of technology. So let's stop and talk to you about why this is happening. Let's have a quick look about how we teach mathematics in schools. This is the description of a mathematics curriculum I found online the other day. It says, the school accommodates boys between the ages of 11 and 14. Classes meet for six days a week. A heavy emphasis is placed on memorization and procedures. And the curriculum is first multiplication, memorization of multiplication facts practice in the use of algorithms, division, then fractions, including the rule of three. Sounds very familiar, just like any other school around. Except that this was the advertisement of a school in Italy run by Master Leonardo Galigai in the year 1519. And if you look at textbooks that they were using, they are pretty much the same we're giving to our middle schoolers these days. This needs to change. Mathematics and science changed radically over the past 500 years, but we keep teaching the same. Seymour Papert said that if a teacher from the 16th century would time travel to the present, he or she would have no problem entering a school and teaching a class. We need to bring engagement and motivation to education. It's no use teaching people a lot of content if they will hate school and learning. Interest and motivation, long-term intellectual engagement, and resilience under the natural frustrations of tackling hard problems, those are the real challenges of the 21st century. But it's very hard to do something different if the space you have for learning looks like this, or this, or this, or this. But we can do differently. Researchers have been talking about this all along. One of them visited Thailand many times, actually, and inspired many people here. This person was Seymour Papert, the father of constructionism, who, along with many participants in this symposium, such as David Cavallo and Carol Sperry, did a lot of work in Thailand already. And Seymour Papert taught me that if I wanted to change learning, I should think about the space where learning happens. And that idea matured for many years and finally made me create the Fab Lab at School project. If you care about sports, you build a gym. Then like-minded students can go there, hang out, talk, learn from each other. If you care about music, you build a music room, you put musical instruments there. But if you are a student and you care about engineering and science, you have nowhere to go. So the Fab Lab at school is designed to be that place. It's a very special place in a school. It's an invention lab, but it's also a science lab, a robotics club, 
and a place for people to hang out and make stuff. And we put the most modern prototyping machines there, such as laser cutters, we can cut any material in any shape, 3D scanners, which can scan and copy real objects, 3D printers, these incredible machines that create real objects, and robotics that gives life to these objects. It is designed in a way that it doesn't look like a traditional lab. It's colorful, it's transparent, it's inviting to exploration. It's a cool place to be, not a space for the usual nerds and geeks. It does not scare people who, do, who, ne who have never built anything or who do don't know anything about technology. It works during the normal school day for innovative teachers to try new ways of teaching their classes or after school for more exploratory endeavors even outside of the school curriculum. And what kind of things do students do in those labs? For example, these girls from a school in California, where we have one of our labs, instead of hearing about Leonardo da Vinci, they could be Leonardo da Vinci, recreating all of his machines using a laser cutter, a laser cutter in under two weeks. Then they got to show it off at the Maker Fair, a big science and engineering show and tell in California. Instead of learning about science by reading a book, the seventh grade class in this Palo Alto High School had students create and assemble their own microscopes and even customize them, making them very personal. Instead of a cold and impersonal instrument that lives in a lab, they took the microscopes home, examined things, took pictures, and brought the materials back to the school. So science became an instrument to get to know more about your life and your environment. You walk around with your scientific instruments, they augment your senses, they become part of your everyday life. This other student in Russia had an amazing story. He was not an engineering type. He was really passionate about music, Bach in particular. And he told us, my childhood dream was to build a robot that could play Bach. But I have no idea how to start. So this student participated in a workshop at his school's fab lab at school for a week and learned how to laser cut, program, control motors, and sensors. In a week, he had an incredible prototype of the flute, but it wasn't good enough. The workshop was over, but now finishing the flute was his project, his idea. We didn't have to give him a grade to finish it. He just kept coming for the lab for two months, several times a week. In the end, he built a flute with 12 servo motors, a really complex control mechanism, and he was able to play some simple Bach melodies by programming a microcontroller board. And he took this project to the National Science Exhibition, a very competitive event in Moscow with hundreds of students from all over the country, and he won third place and he still claims to be just a musician. These two girls in Brazil wanted to solve a big problem. One of them had a sister who had just had a baby and she couldn't do anything around the house. Every five minutes, she had to come back and rock the stroller. For six months, these girls learned about mechanical construction, gearing, electronics, and created a stroller that rocks itself when the baby cries using a sound sensor and a really complex mechanical engineering, most from recycled motors and gears they found in the trash. And it really works. The fab lab at school is not just another lab in a school. It's a disruptive space. In all of our current labs, in just some months, it has become an amazing place for innovation and for new ways of teaching and learning. But why digital fabrication? Do we need to 3D print and laser cut? Maybe we could just settle for scissors and glue, which are a lot cheaper. The reason, as Marshall McLuhan would say, is that we shape tools and tools shape us. The tools we have determine what we can do. The tools we have determine the quality and the complexity of the products we can do, how far we can take our creativity. 
If we want students to build and make stuff, we need to give them the best tools that we have, the tools that will help them realize their most creative ideas. Papert loved the analogy of the pencil. He imagined a time in history when pen pencils had just been invented. Then someone had this idea, let's use pencils in education, but let's go cautiously. Let's put one pencil in each classroom. If kids learn more, we'll put two pencils. Of course, this idea is absurd because a pencil makes a lot of more sense if everybody has an extended exposure to it, if all students can use a pencil. Technology art adds layers of complexity and sophistication to what students can do. Technology augments our cognitive powers. They allow us to understand things in new ways, see patterns that are invisible to the naked eye, and invent and create things. You learn by creating, by constructing with technology. It's not about just doing what school do a bit better, using the internet, watch videos online. It's about enabling students to do things that are unthinkable before, radically new things that will make them fall in love with learning, making things, programming, inventing rather than consuming, questioning rather than accepting, dreaming rather than complaining. And let's not delude ourselves that we can just cram an infinite amount of content into the curriculum. The day has 24 hours. Every hour learning how to do simple-minded calculation is an hour less for problem solving, for thinking mathematically, for more complex and interesting endeavors. We need to make choices. We live in a world that's changing very quickly. Google did not exist 13 years ago. Facebook is six years old. iPads are two years old. In a time like this, we don't need people to do mindless calculations. We need people who are rapid prototypers of ideas. People that will not take 10 years to come up with an idea because they were taught in school that their ideas are bad. We need people who can come up with good ideas, people who are not ashamed of being wrong, of making a mistake, of failing, and can prototype and iterate until the good turns into great. We want to start it very early in Thailand. We want to teach kids since eight or nine years old that school is a place for ideas, to try new ideas, to share ideas, to be wrong about them, to improve them with the help of friends and teachers, not to receive them well packaged in a textbook. We want them to come to school thinking, what am I going to invent today? What powerful ideas I'll bump into today? Seymour Papert said that we should never base our decisions on educational policy just on immediate results. He said that we should always look at where the system is going as a result of that, that innovation. Let us imagine that our innovation is giving more tests to kids. It might improve scores in the short run by increasing the pressure on schools and teachers, but it's taking the system in the wrong direction. I think that here, with the Candlelight Project, the DSIL School and the FabLab at School Project, we are making very hard choices. It is not easy work. It will not happen overnight, but it will be taking the system in the right direction, just like the founders of DSIL did 12 years ago. It wasn't the easy thing to do then, but it's taking the system in the right direction. The way we teach reflects the way we are as a society. I hope that 20 years from now, we'll look back at today and feel happy for having taken the steps in the right direction a direction that celebrates democracy as a way of being, both in society and in our schools, a direction that celebrates intellectual freedom and autonomy that recognizes that children are entitled to have their own interests and passions, a direction that celebrates our natural talent as humans to teach and to learn, a direction that deems education not as a form of mass-producing rigorously identical brains for rigorously meaningless tasks, but as a form of generating better, happier, smarter people. And by the way, those people are your children and your grandchildren. And that is the best possible thing we can do for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Blickstein, for your great presentation.